Our next speaker, as you can see, is John Bamanek, who probably requires not much of an introduction, most currently of Thrust Stop. Actually, I was going to introduce myself as Gadi Evron, because he told all the speakers not to do introductions. So I'm Gadi Evron. I like long walks on the beach, and I'm obsessed with Justin Bieber. Every time you think of Gadi Evron, think of Justin Bieber. Uh, I'm going to talk about creating an authoritative name server reputation, a pr uh, research product, uh, project I did academically the last semester, uh, and this semester will hopefully publish uh, some stuff about that. Right? So about me, moving along. How many people out of my curiosity use, you got a question already? Oh, okay, all right. Well, you can let me ask the question before you answer it, right? Uh, you're worse than my undergrads. What's my? I love all things Justin Bieber. <laughs> but right now we're talking about RPZ, Crossy. Try to focus. How many people use RPZ internally now, right? OK, a, ha a handful of people. Um, most people use only half of the functionality of RPZ, right? You can block on resolved IP address. You can block on uh, the uh, specific host name indicator or, or a wildcard. You can also block on the authoritative name server and the authoritative name server IP address. Uh, the problem is, is that no one actually distributes programmatic feeds uh, of the name server indicators and name server reputation. Um, so most of the feeds that I'm sure that many of you may use only have the first two indicators. I think I'm the only one that probably, at least open source, includes name server information, though I don't recommend you use my DGAs and take those name servers, and we'll talk about how that can go spectacularly wrong here in a second. Uh, some, include, uh, some of these feeds include name server information errantly. Uh, we'll talk about that as we go on. Why that is, is if you think about Cuckoo or Phoenix or all your kind of automated analysis platforms, you know, you, I'm sure everybody here knows how DNS works, so I'm not going to explain it, right? But you've got your client to your sandbox, it reaches out to it something else to do DNS resolution. So it never sees any of that traffic. It only sees, I queried this, I got this back. It doesn't see, oh, it went to this authoritative name server. It doesn't see the chain of events uh, and DNS queries that go on. Uh, and some of that can be interesting and spectacular and horrible and awful because DNS is very interesting, but we're not going to talk about all the amazing ways people do DNS wrong in this particular talk. My motivation is finding ways to automatically block things, right? Or you know, more accurately, finding things that I really don't want to block at the level that I'm blocking. Um, you know, so how do I determine what's safe to block and what's not? Uh, you know, or how not to become a single point of failure of the internet, right? And what I mean by that is so many people use the DGA feeds I provide. That I want to say two or three months ago, somebody registered a DGA domain that collided with something that was registered at Shopify. So a Shopify CDN IP address made into my feed. And so many vendors just take that stuff blind and don't whitelist anything. You could map the monetary loss significantly of Shopify based on the fact that somebody resolved the Shopify and I didn't whitelist because nobody listens to me when I say don't use my IP address without, without scrubbing. So now I'm very mindful of, hey, how do I block things without breaking and causing great collateral damage? Um, Malware and automatic processing queries lots of different things that you don't want to block, right? Uh, you run a sandbox report, there'll be geolocation checks, it might do a Google search. I have OCSP on there as an example because two or three months ago, MSISAC distributed one of their automated threat reports that listed ocsp.amazontrust.com. Uh, that we internally weren't internally whitelisting as threat stop, and it caused a pretty high number of false positives because you can imagine how many things query that. Uh, so creating, uh, there are lots of things uh, that you'll see in artifacts of sandbox runs you never want to block. So to do this, uh, to block at the authoritative name server level, uh, the first thing is identifying benign servers. And as far as I know, no one's done anything like that. So I said, OK, how can I do this programmatically? Obviously, there's doing it on the microeconomic scale. OK, I'm organization A. Here's my authoritative resolvers. Here are the authoritative resolvers, my partners. But how do I do that in a globally representative way? Something else on my mind uh, about doing this is, is eventually, someday, I don't know, IPv6 has been around for 10 years, 10 years or more. 
eventually we're going to adopt it? Maybe, I don't know. But it's gonna break things in a spectacular fashion when it does. And, and I don't know why criminals aren't actually using IPv6 more, right? How are you gonna show down? <laughs> this is not being live streamed, it's okay, right? Uh, maybe, I guess it's going on YouTube. Um, yeah, um, so just if you're taking 64 bits, right? We're, we're creating an IPv6. There is two and a half billion networks for every man, woman, and child on the planet, right? Just obsesses, uh, uh, excessive scale because humanity uh, you know, does excess. It doesn't do moderation. So we're going from one problem to the other problem and it's gonna create all sorts of scaling issues. And I actually looked up the number to describe how many unique IP addresses it's on Decelian. I didn't, because for a while it's like, I don't even know what number describes something this big. Well, it's on Decelian. So if you've learned nothing else, you've learned, uh, you've learned that number. Right? So how to deal with scale is finding ways to do broad blocking that's safely, right? Going after providers, going after uh, the worst TLDs, the worst registrars, the worst ASNs, uh, you know, and, and name servers, right? As name ser authoritative name services is something provided for domain. Uh, and one of uh, the research that I'm going to be doing as part of my PhD is scoring uh, broad infrastructure uh, of those classes of stuff. This is just one small sliver of it. Right, but ultimately find something that the criminals reuse and target that instead. So as they make changes, they're going to reuse something from previous attacks, find that and block it. That way your, your blocking is more persistent and hopefully it scales at least not as awfully as doing things on, on a, a IP by IP um, uh, basis, right? So how to create a whitelist? Popularity is kind of a crude metric. Um, most of the DNS whitelists are based on now uh, umbrella or Majestic, which says, oh, everybody's going to Facebook. You don't want to block Facebook. That's fair, but that's crude. Um, we don't really have a similar metric for name servers, but you can say of the 300 some odd million domains out there, how many domains are registered per name server and how many domains use specific IP addresses? Um, but also keeping in mind what's popular is not, or what's popular is not necessarily benign. Uh, and I use dyna dynamic DNS as an example. No IP is under 100 rank in, in DNS, but who here would just blindly allow everything registered in, in no IP's uh, domain space, right? Nobody would do that. Uh, and then of course, like I said, all of us care about false positives because that breaks things. People complain, they tell us to rip stuff out. That's not a good day at all. Um, so uh, blocking artifacts of that domain or domains because there is reuse of authoritative name servers, right, is helpful. But it also me it provides a metric to say, hey, you know, GoDaddy's name servers are X. I don't ever want to block all of GoDaddy. No matter how tempted I might be to do so, blocking 100 million domains, it's a third of the internet, give or take, probably would be a bad day. Um, you know, so, or at least lead to a lot of complaints. Uh, so, uh, creating lists, I use the Whois, uh, Whois XML API database because I can get the Whois, entire Whois database of globally and uh, country code specific and put it into a database to do analytics locally versus doing something with APIs or something else. They provided it to me for free. It is not the authoritative source of what name servers are authoritative for a domain. It should map the authoritative source, maybe, hopefully, and all the magic that is who is, but it's close enough for now. The authoritative source is actually in the zone files, which you can get a subset of zone files through ICANN. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, so what I did is simply just take a unique count of authoritative name servers by the number of domains served and say, okay, now I've got a reverse score. This name server is hosting 10 million domains. Don't want to block that. This one is doing one. Don't care about that because there's no sticky persistence there. Something in the 300 to 500 range, eh, that might be interesting to block there, right? Uh, and then you could do the same for IP address, turning those authoritative name servers into IPs. 
Uh, normally, that's a very, uh, very problematic thing to do because you can have CDNs and all other things behind host name records that does not exist in the name server world, right? It's, it's all A records. They may be short TTLs or double flux, uh, but by and large, it's a fairly static list that you can get through resolution and not have to go through any particular tricks uh, because for the most part, going to the horribly wonderful and odd world of DNS, most authoritative name server IP addresses are not stored in the zone of the domain. They're stored in the zone of the top level domain because of the race condition of how domain uh, or, or host records uh, have, to, have to be queried in a hierarchical, hierarchical system, right? So why not use ICANN CZDS? Because it's, it's a goat rodeo, as with all things ICANN, right? It really is, right? It, and everybody hates the system ICANN did for this. You can register at, for permission to get zone files, only GTLDs, not, not country code. They will only give you access for 90 days. Permission is done on a per TLD basis, and they can tell you no if they don't want to, right? So who would develop, yes? Is there any recourse for anything that ICANN does unless you're a registrar? The recourse is to become a registrar, pay ICANN lots of money, more than the other registrars, and then ICANN will do what you want. We could set up a GoFundMe, and, and maybe if we put a, enough money together, we can make ICANN great again. <laughs> the system works despite itself, not because of the system. As with everything on the internet, why does it work? I don't know. It just kind of does, and it shouldn't. Um, so, I analyzed what I came up with, um, you know, uh, or any popular records uh, that, that list, uh, control lots of domains in existing threat feeds. I used uh, threat stops internal data because that's, that's what I had that has all of the various feeds aggregated in one place. Uh, and I, I started with only the top 10,000 records, which represented a little less than 90% of all domains on the internet, which I think is interesting, right? Talk about radical centralization. Right? And, and how, how 340 million some odd domains right, are controlled by just 10,000 servers. Right? And every domain has at least two name servers, sometimes up to four. So really you're talking about 5,000 entities that really control the planet right? and as far as the internet's concerned. Uh, I didn't expect it to be that centralized. Uh, for the NSD name, which is the RPZ name for, for the actual authoritative name server host name, I didn't see any instances of those in threat feeds. And you'd expect that because none of the automated systems are in line with the resolver. They just send queries out. For NSIP, on the other hand, there was 1% active and about 16% historical of the top 10,000 you know, name servers that control 90% of the internet have made their way into threat feeds, right? Which strikes me as, as well, I said, a problem that indicates there needs to be some level of scrubbing. Uh, and I wanna say the average, or the, the, low, the, the lower band, when you got to number 10,000, still controlled like 300,000 domains, right? So you're still talking large scale uh, authoritative name servers even, even down there. As an example, right, these are the top, what, 10? Free nom, DNS pod, registrar servers, name bright DNS, all things you've probably seen before, all fairly straightforward. What I was interested in the prevalence of is how many IP addresses were used for authoritative name servers across different domains, right? How much IP reuse there was. Uh, so I, I picked one and you see name.com and domain site. I see a lot of this nonsense, these quasi DGA like ns3.hjx.whatever, all point to the same place. I can't for the life of me figure out why you would add that complexity to point it to the same underlying IP address, because I know of no name server implementation that gives a shit what you call the authoritative name server, because it's only looking at inbound IP address. So I have no idea why you'd bother creating something like this instead of doing name server one dot domain site ns 2namebright I don't know. It was just an interesting anecdote that, that it's all the same IP address. I don't know why you'd engineer it that way, because somebody thought it was cute. So with this data, right, I've got raw counts. And I've got threat feeds, because that's what my company uh, markets in. 
you know, so it becomes easy to create a whitelist, right? You could take the top uh, 1,000 and just say, I'm never going to block these, or the top 10,000, or just some arbitrary number. I haven't think, I don't think I've ever encountered a malicious name server that served more than 1,000 domains, or, or maybe was just above that, but nothing ever lar larger than that, because if a criminal sets up their own auth name server, there's only so many domains they're going to they're gonna register. There's only so many domains they can operationalize, even if you're talking spammers or, or, you know, or pill, pill scammers or any of that nonsense, right? The upper threshold's about 1,000. I'm going to test that experimentally to see if I could figure out what the bands of, of maliciously identified name servers are in terms of domains. I just haven't gotten that far. Uh, but you can also start doing reputational things like calculating maliciousness, right, of per capita abuse, really. Is just say, okay, this name server has 500 domains it's responsible for. I've identified 250 that are malicious. I'm just going to block that name server. I don't know anything about the other 250, but I'm going to bet they're probably bad. Uh, and now I'm blocking things before I've observed them uh, used in an attack or, uh, you know, any number of things to... Uh, to really enhance uh, the security of my organization, at least using DNS RPZ, right? Kind of a rudimentary and crude way of doing statistics. That's not probably how I will operationalize it at ThreatStop, but it's certainly a way to talk about it as far as academic research, because what is uh, malicious, not all maliciousness is the same. Uh, many of the reputational things will score forms of maliciousness differently, of phishing or C2, so on and so forth, right? You get into the complexity of, well, this is a compromised domain, or it's a provider like Dynamic DNS. Do I score uh, no IP uh, negatively based off of the fact that it's got uh, Dynamic DNS stuff and block it at the domain level, right? Um, I would, because there's just no business case for Dynamic DNS. And the enterprise level, probably, Maybe there's somebody out there who's got dynamic DNS that they're using for something. Uh, but, you know, like I said, it, it's kind of crude and there needs to be some precise determination to be had there, right? The other part is, uh, of this is there's kind of an interesting discussion. What got me on this is that I did a, a project for ICANN uh, called the Domain uh, Abu Ac Abuse Activity Reporting System, right? Basically, ICANN miraculously got through, we're going to take a threat feed, we're going to analyze all the domains in a given TLD, and we're going to rank TLDs and registrars by abuse. You can imagine how this went over with the registrars, right? And you could see the commentary about this, right, where they're saying, oh, I don't think you should list this, and boo-hoo, boo right? ICANN's probably not the best place for it. I think it's hilarious that they did it, and I was glad to support it. But there really ought to be external sources of this, and I'll probably publish this at the University of Illinois. So if a registrar ever sues me, then I get to make the Illinois Attorney General defend me in court, and that is hilarious. Um, but you could see some of the reporting you know, based on people grousing about statistics, and when money's involved, people are going to grouse about your math, and then, you know, we've seen, when's the last time an anti-spam outfit was sued? It's been 10 years, I think. But there is a history of litigation against anti-spam outfits based on the data they produce, too. All the code that I did with this is open source, relying on, you know, SED, NOC, and GREP, you know, and PIPE, right? You know, Bash and PIPE are not just a shell interpreter and shell redirects. They fairly accurately describe my coding style. Um, <laughs> So future work, I am going to open source the data, probably as part of the University of Illinois, uh, and provide some mechanism for it uh, in terms of, of reputational data and counts and, and how that's queried and, and whatever. I haven't uh, developed that front end yet. I'm being cautious because I want to avoid the problem I have with my DGA feeds, and anytime somebody's IP address makes it into my feed, then everybody starts yelling at me over it. I don't want to produce yet another resource that gets random people on the internet looking up my phone number. Um, but I am going to make something available to the community at some point, and obviously we'll use it internally at ThreatStop at some point. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that because that's, that's vendor BS, and that's not why I'm here. Does anybody except Ryan Moon have a question? <laughs> Shit. We don't use the the yes, you do. <laughs> How can we help contribute? Well, no, I, 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 <laughs> I, I give me more hours in the day. I mean, the, the work is done. I've got the data. I just need to sit there and productionize it, basically. Um, and so, 
then use it and tell me interesting things about it. I still don't believe you're JB because you're wearing a suit and a tie. If you have a question for me, I insist that tie come off. <laughs> mm-hmm. So anytime you observe an artifact in an SOA, like an email address or a serial number? Oh, the, the authoritative name server, right? Well, if you take an RPZ, uh, RPZ zone file, right? There's a RPZ-IP and RPZ-D name. You, C name, right? It's RPZ-NSD name and NSIP. Exact same format, it's just then dot rpz dash uh, uh, nsd name and nsip yeah <laughs> it's not the first thing it won't be the last i did but you got to unbutton the top button i mean you look like just a total douche <laughs> <laughs> so, so now given that roasting does anybody else have a question <laughs> what goes on in Austin stays in Austin, Crossy. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, well, you can, get, you can get the .com zone file for free, right? There's half the internet, right? You can do work there. I was trying to do something academic, so I needed everything, and I didn't want to go to how many CCTL, CCTLDs there are, like 190? You can, you can do, uh, like yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, now, like I said, if, if I were an enterprise that didn't have a global operation, I'd, I'd be blocking CCTLDs all day and probably everything not .com, net, gov, mil, right, any new GTLD probably could just burn. Yeah, you know, I kind of put my boss's policy blocking Lithuania, so Bitly stopped working and he complained. I told him to get off work, get off the internet and, and start selling things, and that didn't work well. But I, you can deal with some of those issues, too. But yes. You're letting me off easy, then. Thanks, John. Work.